Okay, so uh, welcome to the last session of the day. So uh, my name is Xiang Rui, I'm from Databricks. So at Databricks, I spend most of my time on this uh, machine learning sub-project of Spark called MLlib. Uh, today I'm going to talk about a new feature introduced in uh, MLlib 1.0, it's uh, Spark's data support. And, but before that, since uh, there is no general talk about MLlib during the first two days, but Amit is going to give an introductory talk about MLlib on the third day, on Wednesday. Um, but if, so not everyone is going to the training day, so uh, I want to give a brief introduction of MLlib. So MLlib is basically uh, is a sub-project of uh, Spark implementing uh, many standard machine learning algorithms. The initial code contribution was from uh, Berkeley AmpLab. It's the same group of people that created Spark. And it shipped with Spark since version 0 0.8. That was from September last year. And since then, we have received uh, uh, code contributions from uh, 50 individual contributors. And if you check out my talk uh, maybe a month ago, this number was 33 or 35. So it's really, we have more uh, developers joining us. And I think the numbers will increase a lot after Spark Summit because there are many open PRs now just waiting for review. So for algorithm, machine learning algorithms, we cover uh, just basic linear methods like logistic regression and linear support vector machine and naive Bayes. And we also cover decision tree for classification and also for regression. Uh, we implement uh, alternating list of squares if you went to the Spotify's talk today. And it's for collaborative filtering. And also we recently added an option that can allow non-negative uh, constraints that give you the non-negative matrix factorization. So for clustering, we support k-means clustering. And for other decompo uh, decomposition or uh, dim dimensionality reduction, we have the singular value decomposition and principal component analysis. So that's basically a standard co coverage of machine learning algorithms. So in 1.0, 1.0 was released in the, maybe in May, and we added um, many new features to MLlib. Uh, first, from user's uh, perspective, we update the new user uh, MLlibs guide, and it's more organized. And we add a lot of code examples for MLlib. So if you go to uh, Spark documentation, you can see we support uh, APIs in Java, Python, and Scala. And we have the code tabs, and you can click Java, and you only see ex code examples in Java. And then if you switch to Python, everything is uh, just uh, tailored for Python users. And in 1.0, we also uh, guarantee API stability, so the same following the Spark call. And we have this an annotation for uh, experimental and developer APIs. But even for those APIs, so if we update those APIs, we will provide migration guide between uh, releases. So well, th the rest of them are uh, just new features. We have this sparse data support, also have the decision tree, and we implement distributed matrices with uh, like uh, a linear algebra operations and principal component analysis, singular value decomposition, and also for optimization algorithms, we implemented LBFGS. So, but for today, I'm going to just uh, talk about sparse data support in MLlib. I want to start it with a story. So my, basically my major is computational math. And uh, my thesis is about some large scale uh, sparse linear regression problems. So I, once I wrote a, uh, the following sentence in, in a draft. So I said, uh, I want to really solve large scale sparse linear list of squares. But I sent it to my advisor and he just uh, struck out the the word sparse, and why? So he told me, well, large scale already implied uh, sparse, so you don't have to mention sparse twice. <laughs> yeah, so basically, well, if I say everything that is large scale is also sparse, maybe that's a really bold statement, but 
really, this is true for the world of big data. So sparsity is really almost everywhere. So I can see uh, many sources that uh, can introduce sparsity into your data set. For example, if you want to do feature transformation, and you may want to map uh, numerical features into categorical features, or you may want, want to map categorical features to numerical ones, and then you do all kinds of transformation, interaction, bucketing, and if you want to process text, you want to work with uh, words and engrams, backgrams, trigrams, and then they increase the feature dimension by a lot. And also, so for, for example, for the recommendation, you're working on a huge rating matrix, millions by millions. And then also for other stuff, you also have, you can exploit the slow rank structure, right? So essentially those are all can contribute to sparsity. So for example, I take one example here. I have this uh, one hot encoding. It's a very standard feature transformation. And you want to map, map a categorical feature into numerical. For example, we have a feature called country. And we have uh, Germany, Brazil, Argentina. And so one way to map them in is just assign an index, right? So we map uh, Germany to zero and Brazil to one. Well, then the question is whether we can use it in a linear method, right? Linear method means uh, some, well, linear combination of if this is a fe single feature, after we train the model, we get a, a numerical value indicate the coefficient. What does it mean if the coefficient is 0 0.5, right? So is it, and what's, what's the meaning of 0 0.5 uh, multiplied by one by Brazil or multiplied by two? So it does, so you still need to treat it as a numerical feature. That means it doesn't apply to linear method like logistic regression or linear SVM. So the right way to do that is called this one hot encoding. Basically, for uh, consider that, um, you have 10 categor categories, and then you map each uh, feature value into a vector of size 10. And only one value is one, and all the others are zeros. Then Germany becomes uh, one, zero, 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 and Brazil be becomes uh, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. So in this way, and uh, you map a categorical feature into a set of binary features, then you can use linear method uh, to train this model and get some meaningful result. And but look at the data now, so it contains a lot of zeros. The density is uh, the number of non-zero elements divided by the total element is one over the number of categories. So it's very sparse if you have, uh, well, many categories. So then the next thing is uh, bucketing. So maybe you want to convert a numerical feature to categorical features. For example, we want to work on the time of the day and we want to predict some activity, frequency of some activities. And we can use the second of the day. But well, if I apply a linear method, I assume that it has a linear effect on the, on the value of this feature. But actually no, right? People has a very high activity maybe well, 9 a.m. or maybe after lunch, 2 p.m. So you really want to just transform them into categorical features, like the hour of the day. You create, uh, you create buckets, right? So map each uh, time, a, a single time into those buckets, this hour of day, you have 24 buckets. But now after you have done this mapping, and it becomes sparse. And the density is the one over the number of buckets now. So it's, this is where sparsity comes from. So also I can show you some real uh, world data sets. The first one is Netflix price. It's uh, close to a half million users and 20,000 movies. But the number of observed ratings is just uh, 100 million. So the density is just a little bit over 1%. Also we have this, uh, is a standard uh, training, training data set for, called RCV1. And the number of examples is, again, more than half a million. And number of features is about 50,000. The density is even lower. It's less, than, it's less than 1%. And in this case, you need to really think serious about sparsity. Because if you use a dense format to start the training data set, it will be 270 gigs. 
But if you use a sparse format, well, it's just a 600 megabytes. So I also want to view sparsity in a broader sense. Basically, I want to view the real world data set as either sparse or low rank and plus noise. So think about it, but you, maybe you see, I have a really dense data set, it's uh, all images. A dense image, well, it has an array of pixels, and for each pixel it has three colors, and you have a, a value between zero and uh, 255. So, however, this image looks very dense. However, if you switch to the frequency domain, if you apply some wave wavelet transform or uh, cosine transforms, you will see the image is really sparse. And many coefficients are very small here. The magnitude of those coefficients, you can simply ignore them because they're just noise. So after you ignore, treat them as zeros, the image becomes very sparse. Also, for a huge rating matrix, so for Amazon rating, this is much uh, in a bigger scale than the Netflix rating. It's 6 million by uh, 2 million, 2.5 million. And if we want to make some prediction, do you want to really fill in this matrix? Uh, how much storage you need if you want to re really want to fill in this matrix? So you don't want to do that because you know while well, people's preference uh, fall into very limited categories. Where I always look for some electronics. So other people look for some books, right? So based on those assumptions and the rating matrix is approximately low rank. So you can, you can just represent the matrix by uh, two matrix factors, and then you can reduce the storage, and that's also a, one kind of sparsity. So, um, so sparsity is almost everywhere. So as a user, machine learning user, you need to know how to recognize the sparsity in your data. And if you are a developer for MLlib, so you need to think about how to utilize the sparsity if the training data is indeed sparse. I, I will talk about those two. So in Spark 1.0, and we added uh, sparse data support in all the three APIs. And now we take advantage of sparsity in both storage and computation in all the linear methods, naive Bayes, k-means, summary statistics, single value decomposition, and before 1.0, we also support collaborative filtering is already sparse. The input is already in a sparse format. So before we add sparse, uh, sparse data support, we look over the linear, uh, Java linear algebra packages that can support sparse linear algebra. And we take a look at those linear algebra packages and then did a benchmark on the operations we need. And we will take a look at those operations, basically how to add a sparse vector to a dense vector. And we did a small benchmark and if we pick Breeze as our underlying implementation. And Matrix Toolkit Java is also very fast, but it has some license issues. We cannot include it in uh, Apache project. So we finally, we choose Breeze for this. And the format we use is very simple. Basically, for a sparse data, you just store uh, the non-zero elements. And it basically has three uh, members in uh, the data structure. One is the size of the vector, and the non-zero indices, and the non-zero values. And remember, the indices are always ordered. So that's the storage format we choose. And there are ma some alternatives, like you can use a hash map, or you can use a uh, compressed storage. Well, those are not very efficient for numerical computation because usually we just need sequential access and in our machine learning algorithms. That's, this is the reason we choose this format. So for user, you only need to know how to create a sparse training data set or how to save and load uh, a sparse data set. So basically for create a sparse vector, it's almost the same in all three uh, language APIs. You just call vectors.sparse and with uh, the size of the vector, the index array, and the value array. This is same for all three uh, APIs. And then if you want to create a labeled point, a training example with a sparse feature vector, just call label point uh, with a label and the feature vector. And then you, maybe you want to save your training data set for future use. 
And you can support libsvm format. That's very standard for well, machine learning for classification problems. And you can call this save as libsvm format. It will save the data into libsvm. And we also support in the coming 1.1 release, we have uh, mllibs format. It's uh, something like a JSON type format. Um, but it stores the information about the vector size. So that's different from the major difference from the libsvm format. It doesn't tell you the how, how many uh, the number of features in your data set. So for loading, it's very easy. Just load libsvm file or load label data. That's also available in 1.1. So the next thing I want to focus on how to implement machine learning algorithms that can take advantage of sparsity. Here is basically tell you. Well, for most algorithms, the, the comp run type complexity should be uh, proportional to the number of non-zeros in your data. And, and J means number of non-zeros. So the first example is, I show you, uh, this is example basically from uh, Twitter data. And we have 12 million tweets. And about the feature size, the feature dimension is about 500. And the sparsity, uh, the density is about 10%. So if we store the data set uh, in dense format, it will be about uh, 50 gigs. And if in sparse format, it's just uh, 7 gigs. And the running time also, we, have, uh, one, we receive about four times speed up. So it's uh, both storage and runtime uh, performance gain. So uh, how we can achieve that? So for k-means, it's very standard algorithm. The essential computation is just to uh, compute the pairwise distance. To compute the pairwise distance of two vectors, you need to compare, you need to take the, uh, uh, take the difference of individual uh, components and then compute the sum of squares, right? So let's say even uh, here, the C vector is the, the current center, is average over uh, a set of points Basically, essentially, it will be a dense vector. But the input data point x here will be a sparse vector. So, but if you use this formu formulation to compute the distance, well, you still need to do a linear time on the feature dimension. It's not a linear, take linear time on the number of non-zeros. So, however, if you look at, play with this linear algebra, and then, so the, Par the L2 distance can be expressed as the, the norm square of the sum of norm squares of those two vectors and minus the inner product of them, two time, times two. So now the question is, if we can pre-compute, so C is, uh, the number of clusters is small, and we can compute the, the norm of C. And the norm of X, since X is immutable, X doesn't change we can pre-compute the norm of x as well. Now it's the, the thing left is uh, just the inner product here. And take the inner product of a dense vector with a sparse vector, you only need a, the, a linear time on the number of uh, non-zeros in the sparse vector. So in this way, we can reduce the total running time from, uh, from a, a dense, uh, from the linear time on the uh, feature dimension times number of uh, examples to the number of non-zeros. And also Spark pro, uh, gave us the uh, advantage of caching uh, those norms in memory. And you don't have to recompute it. And you don't have to alternate, alternate the existing data set to store the norms. So it's very efficient. And the next thing is uh, I want to talk about uh, linear methods. So linear method, essential computation is to compute the gradients and compute the sum of them and then do the updates. So what we, why we call it a linear method, basically the loss function can be expressed as a, as a function of the inner product of x transpose, uh, x transpose w. x is the, the current training uh, point and w is the weight, weight vector and y. So since this is, uh, if we can express the loss function in this way, and the gradient can be expressed as uh, f prime times uh, uh, just uh, two doubles and times x. So inside the function, we need to compute the inner product. That still, well, it takes just a um, n number of non-zeros 
uh, and then we do a, a multiply scale this uh, this point by a scalar, and then so it still just takes a, a time of num proportional to the number of non zeros. So we can simply implement in this way, right? So for all the points, we just uh, for each points we compute its gradient, and then we do a reduce, and then it sum them up and get the sum of gradient. But this is not good because first it creates a lot of small objects. It's temporary object. For example, you compute the gradient, and the gradient will return you a temporary vector. And now you sum up two vectors, and you give you a new vector. It's a new object. And the other thing, the other problem with this proposal is it will add adding up sparse vectors. And that is not efficient because you need to modify the index array and you need to modify the value array to reallocate memory to fit in to fit new data. So actually in MLlib, so for each partition, we first generate a dense vector of all zeros. And after we compute the gradient, we do not create a new vector and we add the gradient directly to the dense vector and then compute the sum. So in this way, we can have very fast random access and also just no temporary object creation. So it will be very efficient here. And then we also have this, uh, can take advantage of sparsity in the summary statistics. Basically, we need to ensure that it's both accurate and uh, fast just uh, make the running time depends uh, linearly on the number of non-zeros in your data. So also recently um, we have a PR about uh, sparse singular value decomposition. We can do singular value decomposition and using the, com by computing the eigenvalue decomposition of the gram matrix. So basically the, this value, uh, th this singular value of A is equals to the square root of the, the this, uh, eigenvalue of A transpose A. And we can use Lanzos algorithm to compute the eigenvalue decomposition in an iterative way. So it's very efficient for sparse data. And it only requires a, a function that can pro provide you matrix vector multiplication. That's only a uh, thing this, this algorithm needs. So take a look at this operation. So think about A is a, is a tall matrix with many rows and maybe it's a smaller number of columns. And then we can express this A transpose A. We don't have to compute it. And basically it's a sum of this inner product times each row of A. So, and remember the inner product here is also, well, only takes a number of non-zeros time. And then multiply by A is just a scaling. It's same as a linear method. And then we can compute it really quickly and very efficiently. So the next thing is uh, you need to think about whether your data is dense or sparse, whether I should switch to sparse from dense or whether I should switch to spar uh, dense from sparse. So first one, think about the storage. For sparse formats, we take uh, about uh, 12 times number of non-zeros plus four bytes for the storage. And dense format is just eight times n uh, bytes. But basically, if uh, the number of non-zeros uh, is less than two third of the total number of elements, then well, sparse format can take advantage of storage. But if you are thinking about the running time, that would be really problem dependent. Because sparse in sparse format, the linear algebra operation is not as efficient as dense format. So for k-means, maybe, well, you need a density um, less than 10% to see some certain advantage on the running time. And for linear method, it's not really computation heavy. So then you may, perhaps you need less than 5%, but do play with your data and to see well which one is the best for you. So also in, the, in MLlib, we will introduce new algorithms and then the user will have choice over algorithm, which algorithm to choose. And now, for example, we have this uh, sparse SVD, and also we have this alternating list of squares. Both algorithms provide matrix factorizations. And here, this is an experiment uh, did by Li Pu from uh, Twitter. It's on a Twitter data set about 
The first one is 5 million by 8,000. The second one is 41 million by 42,000. You see the sparse, uh, the singular value decomposition is much faster than ALS. But you need to understand why it's much faster here. So because we implement this alternating list of squares uh, such that it's scalable on both directions. So you can have um, millions by millions rating matrix. But for SVD implementation, we, we assume that the row, each row can be stored in memory. So it only scalable on one direction. But if your data fits this really well, just, please, just choose SVD. Also, there are some difference in the machine learning models as well. But basically, just try to learn your data and try to how to fit, uh, f how to find the best algorithm that fits your data. So for the, um, for the implementation of sparse data support, want to thank, uh, I want to thank the following people. Basically, David Hall is the author of Breeze, and Sam just clear out the, uh, the license issue with Netlib Java. Also, the rest of guys implement all those functions. So to summarize, basically, try to view your data as either sparse or low rank plus noise, and to see how it can change your modeling. And then remember that MLLib supports uh, sparse data in almost all its uh, implemented algorithms. And if you want to contribute more algorithms, think about the uh, complexity, how it is associated with a uh, number of non-zeros in your data. And if you are a user, just try to understand your data and recognize sparsity. So that's. Questions? Yeah, so for sparse matrix, do you, do you store the row vectors or the column vectors? So we will, uh, we will store the column vectors. That's the basically standard from our traditional Fortran and C libraries. Yeah, but uh, think about the running time on decoding. You have you need to have a map, right? So then you need to have uh, know how the ma this value map back to the original value, and that's not efficient in computation. Okay. So, so now yeah. Also, also the other thing is uh, the values are uh, double values. It's not integer values. I think it will be hard to do that half mile encoding. Uh, sorry? Well, if your, if your row input is, is with string P and P and values, uh -huh. how would you suggest storing the map from P's to the sparse? <laughs> so uh, you can basically, you can convert. If your input format is something like coordinate format, you have this a row index, column index, then value. Uh, you can do a group by and order by index and in indexes and then uh, create uh, sparse vectors. So Yes, yes. Even with your new data, you should, uh, the data should be organized such that each observation is a single record, right? And then you can convert each observation into a sparse feature vector. <laughs> yes. So, uh, the centers are computed as the mean of the vectors that's most closest to this center. And think about if you take the mean of many points, and if a single vector contains a non-zero value on this, uh, on this feature index, then, well, it will be non-zero in the final average. So then, well, the cluster center is generally dense. Yeah, stochastic SVD only guarantee approximation. 
and the approximation factor is basically k times log k. So it's hard for user to control and what's the accuracy they want. It's also a randomized algorithm. You cannot guarantee that you always get the right factorization. Well, it's a good model, but uh, we want to start from very basic. Yeah, so we provide exact computation of SVD. Would you get like optimal for computation? So for that one, so we really need to uh, create a matrix that uh, can be scalable on both dimensions, and then the SVD uh, really makes sense. Yeah, otherwise it's not that useful, I think. Yeah. More questions? Mm, right now, all the linear algebra support on a single machine is provided by Breeze. And Breeze underlying the underlying package is native Java, and it's a, basically a Java wrapper over LAPAC and BLAST. And you can call the uh, native Java's implementation of uh, matrix inverse or solve a linear, so linear system. Yeah, yeah. Right now, we don't provide a uh, compute inverse of very big matrices. Okay. Thank you.